Hello there, welcome back to Latina to Latina. You probably know Diane Guerrero for her roles on Orange is the New Black, Jane the Virgin, and Superior Donuts. She is an incredible and compelling actor. But the most captivating story Diane tells is her own. When she was just 14 years old, her parents and older brother were deported to Colombia, leaving Diane to figure out how to make a life for herself in the U.S. Coordinating our schedule so I could fly out to L.A. took a minute, but it was worth it to have the type of conversation she and I had. Where are you coming from? I'm coming from home Mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of uh, frazzled because I'm like packing. I'm going away for vacation for a couple days, and then I'm going to go see my family in Colombia for a week. When is this coming out? Because I'm surprising them. Don't worry. Got I'll it. be surprised. Okay, good. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. I'm preparing to go see my family. And yeah, because so. you don't get to see them very often. No, I don't see them very often. And so, like, every time I do, it's just, like, it's a big deal. And so yeah. um, I'm excited for that. And I've had a, I've had a busy week. Yeah, a really yeah. busy week. Yeah, I have. Big announcements. But yes. Um, I just booked a, a new role for a DC Universe show called Doom Patrol. And I'm really excited for that. I'm playing a character called Crazy Jane who has 64 different personalities. And with each personality comes a different superpower. And it's just like a band of weirdos. And it's like the world that they live in is really interesting. And so I just think it's going to be so interesting to do. And I'm I'm stoked. How do you prepare for a role like that? I'm reading as much material as I can. And I'm reading this book that Crazy Jane is based on, which is a book called Rabbit. I coach for a little bit. And then, you know, you learn as you go. Um, can you tell in the room now if it's working or if it's not working? What do you mean? Like when you go into an audition, do you have times where you're like, that's just not, oh, for sure. not happening? Oh, for sure. I have times where I walk in and I'm like, I'm not right for this. But sometimes you you can get mixed up because sometimes you think you're not right for something, but that's just like that little voice in your head saying you're not good mm-hmm. enough. And then sometimes you're really like, I don't really like this. And, <laughs> you know, it's not really me, I don't think. Or I think somebody else would be better for this role. And that's okay. But it's also good to just give yourself the opportunity. But, yeah, even when you think you're right for something and you're like, wow, that really, <laughs> this is not. I think that's this is not going well. Applicable even for those of us who are not actors. Sure. Where it's like sometimes in a job interview, you're like, oh, I see what you're looking for. And I am not the right person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you will find someone perfect, I, I'm sure. Can you give me a sense of what your day to day is like? Because you have like 17 jobs. I know, right? Like, yeah. why did I do that to myself? <laughs> um, I hate being like, I'm so busy. Because that's a choice. It's a choice. You choose to do this. Obviously, the focus is I need an acting job. And so once that is taken care of, everything else just flows. You know, I have um, the book um, that I do a lot of work with. And I um, and I also work with different organizations and just speaking about uh, issues that matter to me. But I try to just, you know, make sure I I schedule everything in my calendar sometimes that doesn't go according to plan because you also need time for yourself and self-care so I I always have like a dentist appointment we were talking about we have like a like after this I'm trying to rush to go get my retainer tightened you have to take care of yourself in that way and I want to do that but that's all work too so you have to schedule that in in your everyday aside from having like meetings that may or may not go somewhere and you know it's all opportunity yeah. and so I'm I'm all about that I'm all about giving myself the opportunity and knowing um and trying trying things out can we talk about the dentist thing for a second sure. because I I really need you to tell everyone what you told me before we started recording that I eat too much sour candy and I no. get cavities no oh, wow. about your dentist malpractice from your youth so when I was a kid I had to have a tooth pulled out and I went to the dentist and they pulled the wrong tooth out so they went to my mother and they go so we have to re- we have to bring you back and my mother's like why and they go well we pulled the wrong tooth out <laughs> my mom was like what are we in Colombia <laughs> You know, she was like so upset. Of course, we had to come back and, and pull out that tooth and I had to go through that freaking pain all over again. And I mean, I think it's because we had um, mass health. So like, yeah, free care. And so when you have that, it's like you can't really complain. There's like nothing you can say. <laughs> that story is like too real. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. do you, 
Do you look back on your childhood not having a lot of means? Mm -hmm. And like, are there things that now stick out to you? Like, oh, that that's that's not necessarily normal. Um, I mean, what what is normal? I think that now I just realize things that like weren't that easy. Like if you were having trouble in school, like we didn't have money for a tutor. So like those kinds of things I started seeing like, oh, wait, what is stability and what is wealth? Sure, taking vacations are nice, having a nice car, having a nice house, buying clothes. Those things are nice, but those are extras. What stability is being able to get you the help that you need so that you can read better, so that you know your math skills improve. Those kinds of things that are really shaping your brain and that are going to make and like healthcare, right? Those type of things are the things that I'm really noticing now that we were missing, or being able to say, "Hey, mom, I like singing," and for her to put you in singing lessons or with a private tutor, that is privilege. That is wealth, really. And so instead for us, I had to really do my own little research at school and see what kind of free programs were available. Mm -hmm. And now those programs are less and less for people. And that's what really scares me and what really makes me sad because right now there's like less and less money for arts education. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really saved me, I Mm -hmm. think. I was reading the beginning of your new young adult book, My Family Divided, and it starts with you sort of running out the door, so excited to go to school, so excited to sing. And part of what I love is how sassy you are, Mm -hmm. because that, I mean, who wasn't at that age? Everybody was. But then you come home and things aren't the way you left them. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the book opens with the day your, your parents were taken in by ICE later deported do you have guilt about the fact that you were so sassy as you walked out the door that day well yeah of course that's always in my mind that morning I just thought instead of thinking and saying oh my gosh my mom's being sweet and she wants me to eat mom I really can't eat I already gotta go I'm sorry let me take this banana instead I took it so far as to think mom you don't care about my education and I'm pissed off and I'm just gonna go and you know I see her in the door holding the plate of food um and I'm just leaving in a huff and so I went about my day and of course that was the day that my nightmare came to life which was I came home after having a terrible moment with my mother all I wanted to do was apologize to her and I get home and she's gone and, you know, a lot. I'm sure a lot of people have this. A lot of people have fights with their parents, and then their parents actually die. Like, there's crazy stories like that. And I know that that can be heartbreaking, but it's, it's sort of the same thing, right? My family unit sort of died. And my hopes and dreams for my family kind of died at that moment. Well, the old ones, right? You make new ones eventually. But I didn't know that at the time. But in that moment, did you process what had happened? I mean, who told you what had actually happened? Oh, so when I got home... The neighbor, my door was open, you know, I went in, my mother's food was like, for that she was making for dinner was like started. So like beans, rice, it was like plantain cut. I was like, she was of course making my favorite meal. (sighs) So annoying. And, um, and then I walked in and I go, oh my gosh, something's wrong. And so of course the neighbor came in and said, I'm so sorry to tell you, but immigration came and took your parents. And so... That was a moment where I felt really alone. And as a Catholic girl, for me, it was like, oh, this happened because I was bad. Because I did this to my... I I deserve this. And I'm guilty for this. Can you imagine, like, a kid just being like, this is my fault because I was mean to my mom. On top of, like, you know, you're mad at your parents for not having their documentation in order. You have no idea what the immigration system is in this country you don't know your history nobody in the country is talking about this stuff I don't have neighbors I don't have kids who are like hey I'm I'm going through this too it also struck me um I've been reading what they call emergency preparedness forms which is what they recommend that people are undocumented fill out Mm -hmm. so that if someone else needs to take care of their child now that I'm a mom I look at it really differently Mm -hmm. where it's like there are just things I know about my kid that nobody else knows like what she's allergic to and what her favorite song is to be sung at night and like when you start thinking about like what if this were my kid and I had to hand her over to somebody else it becomes 
really real to you uh-huh. what that must mean, not just to the kid, but to a parent. Right. So who raised you? Who raised me? I mean, my my parents did until I was 14. Yeah. And from that moment? From that moment, the community did. And my friend's parents, uh, her mother took me in. I spent about a year and a half with them, and then I went and I stayed with another family after that. And I let my art school know what was going on. And my principal and my music teacher were very involved. I mean, not involved in the, in the fact that they're like, are you coming to school? You're in school. Okay, we take care of you here. We check in with you occasionally. Hey, hi, how are you doing? Yeah. Not to say that they were making house calls because it wasn't like that. But, you know, I had a job. And so that also became my family, you know, anybody who I worked with, my friends. And at any point did your parents say, just come to Columbia? My mother, yes. My mother wanted me to come to Columbia, and I I had just made it very clear that I had goals that I wanted to achieve and that I had to, I had to do them in the States. My parents didn't have money, and usually in a place like Columbia, like, a good education for someone like me who speaks English it costs money to go to like the top bilingual schools in Colombia which what I would would have needed we wouldn't have been able to afford that and so it just made sense for me to stay I mean I was going to an art school I was pursuing my passions and I said this is free I'm gonna work it out on my own and all I need is a place to stay and I said to my parents, as soon as I get to college, which which will be in three years, I'll figure it out. And you did? And I did. We talk a lot, especially with the family separation crisis that's happening in the mm-hmm. U.S., about the long-term consequences of this trauma on children. I mean, for you, as a 32-year-old woman, like... <laughs> I love you. 32. 32. <laughs> yeah, 32. <laughs> It's It's been almost 20 years. I mean, how does this still affect you? I'm still traumatized by it. Um, it's not something that you can get over as easily. This is a lifelong trauma that you will always have, and you just have to work through it. You know, I, I have issues with, I've had issues with relationships, and I mean, who doesn't, right? But like when, when you're a child of trauma, it's just intensified, right? So you have a lot of issues with yourself. You have issues with your parents and your family. And it just seems like it's so hard to really hold on to something and have that be. I don't want to say perfect. And I've taught myself not to say the word perfect because it's like I know perfection doesn't exist. But there is just nothing is easy. <laughs> nothing is easy. It hasn't been easy, and everything is just so much hard work. I want to retreat sometimes. I want to just get under my covers and just not get out of bed, and I know this is the case for a lot of people, and which is why people who have trauma is so important for them to seek mental health and why we need to acknowledge that that family separation is not just, oh, we're just going to take these people, send them off. We never hear from them again. And their kids, well, we don't know. That's not right. It's not right. We have to understand that there's more science behind it and that there are people behind it. You were apparently, though, hiding this all really well for a very long time. Oh, yeah. I mean, were you were you voted most happy-go-lucky? I was voted high, most happy-go-lucky in which, like, So were people not paying attention or were you already a terrific actor I was already a terrific actor um no I was just first of all I am a happy person but when you are trying to mask something so difficult like you don't have any parents here because of this issue that you barely understand but you are feeling sad all the time you know you learn to sort of put a pep in your step and just shake it off. And even when things... I mean, I was... Believe me, I was so sensitive as a kid um, because... Well, are you a Cancer or Leo? I'm a Cancer. Okay. That, well, there you go. And of course, my sign is Cancer. And so that, that's why I'm obviously wicked uh, uh, sensitive. But I was even more sensitive knowing... I mean, I thought I was worthless. You know? I mean, I would wake up and say, I have no parents. I'm not talented, even though this is all I want. And I... 
I'm not smart enough. This is all very hard for me. I'm tired. I'm hungry. There's so many things I want. I'm a loser. But I also am a loser with a lot of pride. And (laughs) there was no way that I could go to school and show people this. And so even when like a simple argument between a friend and I or a boy didn't like me or somebody made fun of me or I would take it so personally that my first instinct was to be upset and sad and say hey you hurt my feelings but instead I would say nothing's wrong everything's okay I'm super strong and my parents weren't deported and I'm super happy and I have no problems imagine if like you continue bottling this up for so long Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to come out at some point, and it did, of course, later on. So let's talk about how that supposed loser becomes a really big winner, because you then go to college. You're you're on this path that's not an acting path. In fact, like at 24, all of a sudden, you decide. I I know. Which I think some people would consider late. It is late. I thought it was late, too. So you're going to go to law school. I mean, you're going to pursue more of a policy activism career. How do you make that left turn into acting? I mean, I've always been interested in social justice and how, I mean, believe me, I tried different ways where I would fit in because, and when I say fit in is like where I could excel in. I just found out I had learning disabilities when I got to college. What type of learning disabilities? Like dyslexia and, um, in both math and in in reading and uh, I know, and uh, and and then ADD. So I had these disabilities that I didn't know about. So, you know, I get to college and I'm like, everything is super hard. You know, I didn't know I needed more time on tests. I didn't know that you could do that, that that some can happen. Challenges. You know, there are some challenges. And so I was trying to figure out where I would fit in. And so at this point, I'm not doing the arts anymore because I'm thinking that's a pipe dream. That's dumb. You don't have a family. There's no way that you can become an actor. Actors, you know, actors can be actors because they don't have to... Pay their bills. Pay their bills. Exactly. Pay their bills. And And pay their parents' bills. And their their parents' bills. Exactly. So I was like, okay, that's gone. But I still had interest in social justice. And so I was trying to figure out a way where I can put those passions together. And I I thought I was going to be like a news reporter. I was trying to figure it out. Then at one point, I thought I was going to be a diplomat. Then at one point, I thought I was going to be a paralegal or a lawyer. So what brought me here was... (laughs) That I was just, I got to the point where I was too damn depressed to, like, do anything else that made me unhappy. And so I started seeing a therapist who suggested that I go back. Uh, She was like, what do you really want to do? What do you really want to do with your life? And I was like, well, I want to be, I want to help my community. And how do you want to do that? Well, I'm just, I'm not good at anything else. I'm not going to pass the bar. I don't know what I'm going to do. What do you really want to do? I want to be an actor. Fuck. Okay, so that there is so different from what you just told me. I'm like, well, this is what I really want to do. But it's scary to say it. I can't say it out loud. And so she was like, just start taking acting classes and just see where that goes. Just don't have any expectations. Just take the class and see how that makes you feel. And I started doing it, and and it did. It, it gave me new purpose. It, it was challenging, but something that I could handle, something that I could actually put my skills to, which is, like, my ability to empathize and my ability to, I guess, access feelings that I was feeling all the time. And I had a sense of humor, and I really wanted to use that. You know, every time I would work at a law office, you know, I'd be like, hey, how are you doing, John? How are you doing? Brent, you know, co yeah. Hey, Brent. You know, yeah, exactly. Hey, this person, called, you know. And so then when you read, for, did you read for Maritza? So I was in Boston, and I was just, like, auditioning. I mean, who auditioned in Boston? But you get what you can, you know, you, you got to start somewhere, honey. Um, so I was just there and I was auditioning for like random stuff like my friends had music videos that they were doing and scary movies in their backyard and I was just like literally just taking advantage of every single thing and I was like I have to wet my feet before I go into like a real audition room and and then I started um, I auditioned for this one show and I got it it was like literally driving over a dead person this show called Body of Proof and I was like that's (laughs) all I needed for me to be like I'm gonna be a star you know I was like oh that's it I got this role 
And so I'm like, imagine the possibilities. And that's who I am. Like, all I need is a taste of success to know that there can be open doors, that I can open doors, as small or large as it is. And then I just moved to New York, and I and I started auditioning. I started working at, um, at Susan Batson Studios, which is great. Finally, I met, like, a big community of actors, and I think that's been the thing, really, is that all of my life... I have been able to show some vulnerability that has that has allowed for others to help me and I have been able to accept help even though there were times where it was hard. How though in those early days of Orange did you make ends meet? Oh, I worked at like any I, I worked at a bar. Yeah, that was the way to do it. Yeah, you got to work at bars. You don't have to, but if you have like no money, and you don't have time to be on in a nine to five during the day, which is the, when you have to audition. Yeah, you got to work at night. So, you know, you're in New York. Everybody's a bartender. Everybody's, you know, a bottle service person. And it was great. I worked at night and then I would audition during the day. And that's how I would make it. I mean, believe me, it was it was like by the skin of my teeth. And then Orange actually... Yeah, I read for the part. I didn't know what Orange was, but I was excited to audition, obviously. I didn't get many auditions when you're starting out. That's another thing. When you're starting out, you can't even get in the room. You know, you cannot even get in the room. So this was something my manager had found for me, and I went in, and I just I just decided I was just going to try to just be. And did you know it in the room? Were you like, this is it? No, I had no idea. No, I did leave happy as hell out of that audition. And I'll tell you why. It's because I left it at the door. Mm-hmm. I left it at the door. And I already had started like sort of practicing this is that every time I would go to an audition, I would have this, you know, you have sides with you, yep. um, the material. And so I would like, I would do the audition, whether I did well or not so good or who knows, I would throw those sides away. <laughs> as soon as I walked out of the room, I'd throw the sides away and I'd be like, this is done. I'm done with this. If they call me again, great. If they don't, that's fine. That's, this is how I'm going to survive this whole rejection process because the rejection is so real that it hurts. And if you hold on to these things, it's hard for you to be ready for the next opportunity because this business is just so fast. And so, yeah, I, I felt really good leaving out of there. I called my dad. I was like, Dad, I think I did well. He said, oh, do you think you're going to get it? I'm like, no, I don't think so. But I think I really, you know, I had a good time in there. And I went home. And then, like, I think it was, like, a month later, it, like, called me. <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't even hear back for a long time. And then you get Jane. Yeah. And then you get Superior Do- I mean, it feels like then the ball really starts rolling. Sure. I mean, in Orange especially, it was just, like, a huge deal because of the stories that we were telling and because it was a show with all of these amazing women who so many people could relate to. I mean, look, if you couldn't relate to me, you could relate to another girl. And it went on and on and on. And so women were so hungry for that. Yeah. And also how... Netflix was being watched. I mean, this was so new. Binge watching. Right. That like we started all that. Like House of Cards, Orange is the New Black. I feel like this is going to be like Al Gore saying he invented the internet. No, no, this like... is I, no, I'm actually saying I invented <laughs> Netflix. Is what I'm saying. No, well, look, binge watching was already being done. However, original yeah. content like yeah. that really wasn't. Like you'll talk to anybody on Orange, everybody will tell you, "Oh, we thought it was a web series." That's what I thought. <laughs> Which, and web series are killing it. Yep. And they have. And so. No, it was not a web series. You know what I'm saying? No, it wasn't. But I'm telling you, that was a very new way to watch content. That was a way that people were able to see me. Let's get you to the dentist. Thank you so much. I have a cavity. <laughs> As she grabs her candy. As I grab a, a sour punch <laughs> straw. Thanks for joining us today. Latina to Latina was originally co-created with Bustle. Now, the podcast is executive produced by Juleka Lentigua-Williams and me. Sound edited by Aluakemi Aladesui. Email us at hola at latinatolatina.com. Send us ideas for guests or talk to us about what's on your mind right now. Remember to subscribe or follow us on Radio Public, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you're listening. And please leave a review. We love hearing from you.